office that includes sirens and voice commands. Uh, we've done a lot internally with our procedures. We've done tabletop exercises. We have posted emergency communication in our buildings. We have worked with all of the uh, faculty as of last year to make sure we understand what we need to do. I think we've gotten better in that regard. We launched last year our regional engagement activity through uh, David Rudy and his folks in IRAP, and we held a series of community listening forums. We put together a regional advisory council, and that work has begun. This summer, we had a redesigned summer school program designed to make it uh, more uh, flexible, to be more accessible to students. I haven't seen the numbers yet, but uh, I'm hopeful that we attracted more students to summer school this summer than last. We have a lot of capacity to do more in the summer. And my sense is with 27% of our students in part-time or online status, we could be doing more in the summer. We enriched the lives of more than 40,000 public school children last, this last year through the Lucille Cottle Little Theaters group that's uh, conducted our communication and theater. The last fraction hero that I mentioned a few moments ago was one of those productions which we took on the road. We completed an extensive NCAA uh, institutional self-study and we'll have a visit in October. So these are just some of the good things that happened this last year in the midst of all the other stuff that was going on. I spoke to you earlier about uh, the pride in our institution. I believe we have much to be proud of at Moorhead State University, and I propose that we make pride raising a high priority for all of us. It's easy for us to get down in the dumps and to say, woe is me and things aren't good, but I would say to you that Moorhead State University has been and continues to be a very, very good institution, one that changes the lives of people throughout this region, and I hope you will join me in pride raising. Pride raising is really essential for us as we go forward into our first ever capital campaign. This university has never done that before. We have an endowment that has about $30 million in it. We need to triple that endowment in the next several years, and that's a pretty lofty goal, but there are lots of people in this country that love this university, that are connected to us in some way, that I think if they see that we are proud of this institution, they will want to join us in taking pride in it as well, in contributing in their, of their time, in their talents, in their financial resources. And I hope you will help me do that. It will take all of us for that to occur. It'll, it'll take people hearing the good things you have to say about the place you work. It'll take our students saying the good things about the place from which they recently graduated. It'll take business and community leaders to recognize us as having a transformational educational program at Moorhead State University. Today I think I'm the proudest of the fact that despite a long, hard period on several fronts, a time that we might look back on, or at least I might look back on, is our or my winter of discontent it is clear that our, continue, our institution continues to remain focused on becoming the best regional university in the South. Several of you have asked me about what that means, and I want to spend the rest of my time talking about that in, as a segue to the future. That idea means a lot of things to a lot of people. For some, for the skeptic, it means something that's not achievable. Why waste our time talking about it? For some, something that would be hard to accomplish but maybe could be accomplished. And for others, a desire to do something really great for an institution that has meant a lot to people in this region. Does it mean literally that what we want to do is overtake James Madison? And we use them as an example because if you look at the U.S. News and World Report, they're ranked as the top institution in our tier. We sent the President's Leadership Academy class up there the year before last to visit James Madison, and they came back with a lot of good ideas of things they saw, observed, and heard that they said, these are things we could do at Moorhead State that'll ha help us become better. Well, maybe that is the goal. Maybe that's part of it. Does it mean that we'll walk away from our historic mission that we in uh, Eastern Kentucky have played to serve the underserved communities in the region? No, that's not what we're going to do. 
But I want us, for every student that we admit to the university, I want us to be honest with ourselves and believe that that student has the probability of being successful here. There is no sense in us bringing students to the campus that we, that you as faculty and staff would know that student probably can't be successful here. Let's focus on the students that we know we can help. And there are many of them in our regional community communities uh, that we can assist. Does it mean that we're waiting for some wealthy benefactor to give us 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars to make the endowment double or triple? Well, boy, that's a nice idea, but it happens rarely uh, on college campuses. You know, there are half a dozen that have benefited by that. What it means for us, though, is that we've got to work diligently to be prideful about this institution to attract folks that will want to give. The best answer that I can give you today about becoming the best regional institution in the South has to do with some of what I would say is my current must list. Let me share these with you, and I hope you will consider adopting some of these as ideas that you believe worthy of helping this institution move forward. Because for me, when I describe these to you, if you're thoughtful, you'll know we're already accomplishing some of these, but we have more work to do. We must continually attract and retain and develop the very best faculty and staff that this institution can attract. The very best. I'm going to tell you a secret. You have a key role to play in that. You have a key role to play in that. I've worked at four different institutions. The reason I came to Moorhead State University was because some of you made a compelling argument that this was a really good place to come. A fine institution with a great mission. I bought into it. And so when we interview, when we advertise positions, what I hope that you will do is you'll call your colleagues wherever they are and you will say to them, come to Moorhead State University. This is a good place to be. And believe it. If we bring colleagues to campus and what they hear from us is, yeah, it's okay. It's a good place, okay. If that's the attitude we have about the place, we will not attract. It doesn't matter how much money we put in a faculty salary or a staff salary. That won't attract the very best people. The other part of that equation was once we get them here, we've got to help them develop. We've got to continue their development. We've got to support them with their goals and objectives. You play a key role in that as well. What I'm saying to you is that faculty colleagues and staff colleagues have a great deal to do with how we feel about ourselves and how good this place is or isn't. I hope you will join me in making sure that we make this a very welcoming place for everyone. We must create and maintain a campus culture that embraces change. We're in the midst right now of going through an academic audit where you heard some announcements this morning about the general education review. You've heard this business about budget cuts. All that creates anxiety. But you know what? Change is good for us. And I'm not talking about change for change's change sake. I've never been interested in that. But there are things that we must do as an institution to become a 21st century institution. And you and I have to work together to, to cause that to occur. But we've got to embrace change in order for it to happen. We must enhance our campus climate. We must make sure that we're welcoming those that are different from ourselves in terms of race, in terms of belief, in terms of practice, what, whatever those are. In fact, we won't be a great institution unless we're a more diverse institution. It'd be a pretty crummy place to work if everybody here was like me, right? If everybody looked like me, sounded like me, acted like me, right, Sue? <laughs> You know what I'm saying, we, diversity enriches the environment. The diversity of ideas, the diversity of personalities, the diversity of cultures and language. We need to do everything we can to embrace diversity and make it happen on our campus. We must become a marketplace of ideas and we must be willing to engage in civil discourse as we sort out the best from the rest. 
Universities are places that historically are the marketplace of ideas, but sometimes we hunker down and we're not willing to talk about the things that are important. Not only that, we are not willing to do it in a civil way. I would challenge us to be civil with one another as we have conversations about whatever difficult topics we need to have. Name calling, backbiting, undertow, that doesn't help anybody. All that does is create a climate of uh, unwelcoming to many people. We've got to change our ways if we're behaving that way in some places. I appreciate those of you that attended one of our listening sessions this summer. I've spoken of that. I will continue to do more things to have conversation with you and all of our faculty and staff. I think it's important for you to understand what I believe, what I'm trying to do, because really I hope to be a reflection of what our community wants for itself. And so I've tried to listen to your ideas, I've tried to understand your fears and concerns, and I've tried to address those in my way to help us move forward. Sometimes I get it right, sometimes I may not have it right. And I'm not opposed to people saying, you know, we need to tweak this. I'm perfectly willing to tweak. But the manner in which we approach one another about the tweaking might be instructive. We must adopt with vigor the notion of the teacher-scholar. There is good literature in this area, and we shouldn't run from it, we shouldn't hide from it. I've heard people say, you know, we're historically a teaching institution, we shouldn't become a research institution. I've heard people say, we're already doing enough service around here, we can't do any more. The best idea of the teacher-scholar is, is an individual who is steeped in his or her discipline and understands how to transmit the ideas, the concepts, the principles, the values of the discipline to the students that they're working with, and then to figure out how to make those germane to the world in which we live. To me, those are the best ideas. And so scholarship should not be antithetical to good teaching. In fact, I would argue you can't be a good teacher unless you're a scholar because you're not up to date in your discipline. You're not participating in the discipline. So let's not worry about who gets credit for what. Let's figure out how to work together where we have scholars and teachers and folks that are interested in service all contributing to the overall mission of the institution. The provost is working on a differentiated workload for faculty and that's at the heart of that idea is to figure out who best can contribute to these things in different ways. We must aggressively recruit those students that have a high probability of success. I've mentioned that idea. We've got to accept the fact that there are some students that we've admitted in the past that are going to have grave difficulty uh, excelling in our institution. So maybe we need to knuckle down and be more careful about who we admit. We must never rest until we've done everything within our power to guide, encourage, and mentor our students to achieve graduation. You know, four in 10 may be a good average for a, a baseball player, a batter, but it's not so good when you're talking about the number of students that graduate in six years from our university, four in 10. Our graduation rate right now for first time, full time students in the six year cohort is 42%. I can present the arguments as I do regularly when I talk to legislators and others why that's not a great number. Well, they transfer, well, they, you know, we know all that. But the fact of the matter is we have too many students that are leaking out of our own pipeline here at the university. If we're going to achieve our part of doubling the numbers, which is the state mandate, one significant component of that for us is we must improve retention. And I'm not talking about giving students grades. I'm not talking about passing people through. I'm talking about finding real strategies to help students who, are, who run up against life just like you and I ran up against life and we continue to run up against life in what we deal with today. We have students that leave the academy because they don't have money. We have students that leave the academy because they have academic problems. We have students that leave the academy because they have to go home and take care of their grandmother. We have students that leave the academy because they have trouble with their roommates. They can't afford gasoline. I mean, you know the list is very long. But there are things we can do if we're serious about taking an aggressive role to mentor every student on this campus. So if you're a faculty member, 
I trust you have office hours. I trust you know every student by name, or at least you try to. I trust you're doing everything you can to help counsel and direct students when they ask you about career. You know, how did you get to where you are? How do I become a, a research biologist? How do I become a, 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 a social worker? How do, how do I become the president of a university? I had some women ask me that question, some of our students last semester. And so I took the time to explain to them at least how it worked in my life. I want to be sure that all of us are committed to that. And it's not just the faculty. It's the people in enrollment services, the bursar's office, the parking attendants, everybody that in continue to, we will continue to concentrate our resources to improve classroom facilities, major renovation going on this summer and continuing in Raider Hall where we're creating some up-to-date modern classrooms with appropriate technology. Uh, next year we'll move to another building, another classroom building and invest there to do likewise. We must provide vibrant extracurricular and co-curricular activities, including a competitive intercollegiate athletics program to involve students in learning that occurs outside of the classroom. You and I both know a lot of learning happens in extracurricular places, fraternities, sororities, campus religious organizations, whatever those are, students get connected there and that's a good thing. We must seek out and we must cultivate persons who share our vision and our values and who are willing to show pride in the institution and generally support by investing in their personal time, their treasure, and their talents. We must continue the quest to transform the institution to a 21st century institution. We can discuss that, we can debate it, but the truth of the matter is we've got to have 21st century programs. The audit the general education review will address parts of that, but that's not all of it. Another piece of our uh, vital review with general education will be to seek the right balance between career-oriented degree programs in, in general or liberal education. We know more and more that when students graduate from the university and go on into careers, they're going to change careers three, four, or five times in their lifetime. And that's just the natural way that things are going in the world in which we live. So the centrality of the question becomes, what essential information do they have to have that will enable them to be lifelong learners, like we are? And that has to be answered in this general education review. It's a central question. Um, we have to make sure that our students have a global perspective. Look at the Olympics in China in terms of what's it's highlighted for many of us in the world, what's happening in that country. The, the size of their population, the veracity of their appetite for, for oil, petroleum products, and you know what? Those folks would like to have the same lifestyle we have, and yet the average wage in China today is about $25 a week. Think what will happen when that two billion people, when those two billion people get on this uh, agenda and, and decide that they want the same kinds of uh, things we have and the quality of life that we have. I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, Sam Faulkner has taken on the challenge of becoming the Interim Director of International Studies. Sam has put together a plan based on what many of you have told him about what we should do in that area. And I trust as part of general education that we'll have a requirement there that will enable our students to learn the right things, whatever you decide those are, about this global culture, about language. We've got to find ways to enable our students to travel abroad, or how about even within our own country, because many of our kids come from small communities and coming to Moorhead is a really big deal. We need to help them see the, the global nature of the world in which we live in and provide them opportunities to experience it. And just as important as these things is the ongoing study of vital student support functions like academic advising, retention, counseling, orientation, and testing. We've got to look at all that with the eye towards how best to serve the students that come to our university. The Carnegie Foundation last year uh, told us that we deserve to be identified as an, engage, an institution that was an engaged institution. I think that's a wonderful descriptor because this institution for many, many years has done that. We've been in a light unto the mountains of East Kentucky. We have five regional campuses. We're out and about, but we still have intractable problems to address, so we've got to do more. This year, more than ever, and in spite of the work that we face, 
it still gives me a great deal of pride to say to you that our university is sound and I believe that we are firmly on a course to become the best public regional university in the South. With that said, I would be pleased to take questions. I think this is a good opportunity for you to ask anything you want about any subject. There are some folks with, there are two microphones here and we'll ask uh, Madonna and Beth to come down the aisle and I'd be happy to try to answer any question that you have. Thank you very much for your attention this morning. I know I talked perhaps longer than you hoped, um, <laughs> but I trust it was instructive. Thank you. Does anybody have a question about anything? Yes, Drew. You've mentioned several times about the capital construction project, and I may have just missed it, but is there a plan or an intention for the uh, goal in this project? Is there like a particular building that's going to be built or uh, an academic complex, or what's the purpose behind it? Well, in, in terms of capital, the question was about our capital construction projects. We have a six-year capital uh, plan at Moritz State University that we are required to submit. That plan consists of the priorities that we believe to be the essential priorities as funding is provided for capital uh, construction. The next, there, the next uh, project on that list is to finish a component of the space science building that is unfinished. There's a clean room uh, facility in that building that we were unable to fund with the almost $16 million we had. So that space will be shelled in. That's a $9.6 million project. The next project on that list is a $49 million renovation of the University Center. You know, five years ago, I guess, the renovation occurred out here on the front half of that building, but the whole back end of the building is as it was for the last 30 years or so. The kitchen, all the meeting rooms back there are out of date. The building infrastructure needs to be updated. Uh, so that's part of it. Plus, an addition which would, which would got on the lawn as we face it here to the left, that addition would take in uh, facilities such as enrollment services, the student health clinic, advising, counseling, career services, and try to consolidate in one place all those student services. So uh, that list is, is uh, updated on an annual basis, but those are the top two priorities on the list right now. The next major renovation of an academic building is the uh, business building. I think that's the third priority on the list. Is that right, Beth? Yeah, Combs. Thank you. <clears throat> 